start up the recording and let me go ahead and make sure we're all connected. Okay, so we have started recording and we're going to start out with templates and containers. Okay, so if I go to my local host and I log in, which is running our 5.1.1 version, which you can see right here, whenever you go to log in, it was released on March 26th of 2019. So I'll log in and I'll go to first to see what powers templates. Let's look inside this application directory and themes. It's very, very easy to cut up any design. And within, I would say two hours is normal, um, maybe four hours for something more complex, but really a, a, a good front end web developer should be able to take any HTML for any design, uh, any existing web page, and chop it up into four files and begin building templates with it in about the two to four hour range, which is very fast and it's very convenient. It's very easy uh, to do. If you look inside of our ski resort theme, you're going to see the same four files, a footer VTL, a header VTL, a template VTL, and an HTML underscore head VTL. You look in the quest, it's the same four files. The rest is just, you know, your SAS, your, you know, your J JavaScript, your images, you know, other things you're using uh, for that theme. Uh, the landing page, it's just got a footer and a HTML head VTL. Uh, the intranet theme, same four files, right? So um, how do those files actually come together to be, to make multiple uh, templates? Well, I'm just covering the basics of it. We're not going to get really into the code. But what the template VTL does, it's the one velocity template language file that controls them all, is it senses the template designer. And if in the template designer you say you want a header and a footer for your template that you're making, then it will parse the header VTL and parse the footer VTL. That's that's it. And so we'll see, you know, inside that template VTL, you can see that it's, you know, it's including these files if the template designer has a checkbox for um, the, the the header and the HTML underscore head as well. Then the template VTL will take whatever framework and you can edit the template VTL and you can change the framework to be your own framework or any other framework. We have bootstrap themes by default just because it's a pretty solid standard, but you can manipulate that and make it any framework. As a matter of fact, on.cms.com, we have other framework starter template VTLs that uh, you can download and uh, put right into uh, .cms and start creating using that, that alternative framework, right? So where do you know what the variables are that the template VTL is relying on to interact with the template designer? Well, uh, if you go to our documentation on .cms.com and you look up themes and installing a theme, creating a new theme, creating the template VTL, Okay, so here in creating the template VTL under themes, you can see those variables. So the template designer sets dot theme layout dot sidebar dot theme layout dot body dot theme dot path automatically. So uh, you know if you say you want a sidebar. Uh, and then you check box, you know, or radio button left or right, then, you know, this is sidebar location will be set to either left or right. Whenever you say you want a 20% or 30% or 40% width on that sidebar, it will set this variable. So if you look at this document, it will give you creating the template VTL. This will give you all of the variables, all of the ways that .cms, uh, that template VTL is including the HTML underscore head. If 
you know, the dot theme layout is set, you know, dot theme layout header is set, then, you know, it's going to include the header VTL, include the footer VTL. So that's kind of, uh, you know, the necessary pre-processing and post-processing uh, files. All of that is there inside of themes. So what we're going to do is create a new base quest theme right now and um, then we'll go ahead and apply it to some pages and then alter the layout from there. So if I go to my template designer, this portlet is for creating new templates. Now I can do one of two different things. I can either add a new template designer template or add an advanced template. So I'll add a template designer template and I'll say uh, new um, to column quest with uh, maybe a 30, percent sidebar okay so um, I'm I said it'll be quest so I'm going to choose quest as a, the theme to create this new template sidebar uh, is 30 percent on the left so I'm going to choose that you can see it adds the sidebar here and then um, I want to use a sub nav container which we'll get to that in a little bit so I'm going to use the one on demo.cms.com and then here I will just add a large you know column container this one's on demo okay so that's pretty much it I could add more rows after I add another row I can you know choose any of these specific split widths but you know this does not take care of every possible column separator that you could possibly do on uh, temp when templating. So we do have the advanced template designer. If you want to get around things like this, it's easier to use the template designer than to try and reprogram this side column. You know, trust us on that one. <laughs> you know, um, it is easy to edit any of the VTL files, but if you're going to vary from the uh, layout options that you have here in the template designer, that's where you'd use the advanced template. So I'm going to eliminate that extra row. I don't need it. I'm going to save and publish this new template, and then I can start creating new pages. So I'm going to just right-click on my About Us section, create a new page, regular page asset, and then I'm going to you know, use this new two-column quest with 30% sidebar, uh, new test page, and save and publish, and that will bring me into uh, edit mode. Or preview mode actually on this new template we can see the sidebars over here on the left I click on edit mode and now I can start adding content now let's say going even further into the no code options right because once the theme is created for us by the webmaster then really any content publisher could do everything that I'm doing right now um, then the content publisher further wants to um, vary from the layout. This little layout option takes the template that is being used by the page and if we want to look at what templates being used by the page we can see this base template. Right? Templates are used across multiple pages or can be used across multiple pages. The second that I actually click layout over here, let's say I want this middle body area to be uh, another, you know, split into two columns, I can do that and I, I'm going to right now create a one-off uh, this new layout that I'm about to design is going to apply to this page only, and um, I'm not creating a new template, but I'm creating a new extension of that template called a layout that will apply to this page and this page only. Let's say I wanted to add a new container over here, and I can use um, the same uh, container if I want. So I'm going to click here. I've got my screen expanded, so it takes a little bit of clicking to get the right area. I zoomed in on it for the purposes of the, and I could switch, you know, themes at the same time, you know, change those on the fly, decide whether I want a, a, a sidebar or not, a header or not, um, go to back to my page properties, but I went ahead and saved this change. I go back to content. Now I've got this other uh, column over here that I can add content to, and I can keep going back to that layout and changing it over and over again. And once again, let's say, if, what if I wanted to add a widget over here? Maybe I want to add a, um, a video. 
So I can put a little video uh, icon over here, and then maybe here I want to add the About Us um, Quest content. Then I can just go ahead and go to Generic Content, About Quest, and place that on the page there. So, um, you know, or just add new, you know, content uh, using the buttons on the right-hand side. You know, I just add new of any anything that I want. And of course I can click and I can move this content around and it should perfectly fit whatever container, as long as the container allows this type of content. I'm actually reusing the same container um, in both places, right? So, uh, and like I've said before, if you do have questions, um, feel free to chat them in and I will be covering them right after I cover a few sections inside of our agenda, all right? Okay, so now, how does the template that I've created um, interact with these uh, layouts and, and you know uh, and the content and the formatting of the content on the page? Like how does how does this large container know that this is supposed to be styled this way and the body is supposed to be styled this way? Right. So um, that is controlled in the container. Now, before we switch over to that, I'm going to cover the second option here under templates, and then we'll see the parsing of the containers, and then we'll look at the containers and see how that controls the content uh, and the way that content displays. All right, so if I look at um, the intranet one column theme, that one is a regular... I think it's intranet home page. Yeah, intranet home page. This is a, an advanced uh, template that allows you to lay out the divs, you to decide how you want everything gridded out. It, this one's still using Bootstrap, but you could use something else just by changing the divs and um, in your uh, you parsing your own header files. And in those header files, you could be loading whatever other alternate framework that you wish. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new container. I'm going to parse it in here and show you how that container formatting works. So we're kind of going to cover containers and what is an advanced template at the same time. And I'll use a, a in this intranet homepage. So I'm actually going to copy intranet homepage. So I've now copied it. And now I'm going to say intranet... Um, movies template okay so i'm going to save that and then we're going to alter the code here but first we got to create a new container that will handle all our movies and automatically style it and then we'll place that inside the advanced template the in a you know using a little bit of code uh, instead of using the template designer okay so i have no movies container here so i'm going to add one And if you remember, we added the movies content type last time. So you add the name of the container and then you decide whether this container is going to have zero content contribution. That means uh, if you leave it like this, it's it'd just be a header or a footer. It's static uh, kind of um, content and, and uh, it, it's not meant for content contribution by content publishers. But if you do want content publishers to be able to use it, then you have to say, uh, limit to the static code that they might place how many you know contents they can put in that container let's just put 20 okay so once you do that you will see this automatically expand into a pre loop um, a main content type or code area and then a post loop that you might want to happen after everyone places their their multiple static content so here I'm going to type in movies to find that movie content type we created yesterday. So I type MOV, it finds movies, and then I can add that content type, get rid of banner. Then once I do that, this field is smart enough to realize that I've selected a certain content type. So if I click add variable, it's going to allow me to add the movie poster, the title, the things that are on that specific content type. But first I'm going to add, maybe I want my movie title to be an inside of an H2. So I'm going to H2, it auto completes for me there. So I refocus my mouse and I want the movie title there. So I just put in 
you know, title, it adds the velocity variable for me. Then maybe inside of a P tag, I want uh, the movie description. So I'm going to add variable and put description here. All right. And then maybe I want... I'm just going to be very quick and simple about this. And right here inside this P tag, I'm going to add the poster resized. And actually, this is a little bit of old code for poster resizing. We can, we don't need the language. Let's say we want our poster to be with 200. We can leave it like that for expediency and then I'm gonna show you how to do this better. And we're just trying to get this going real quick. Okay, so then I'll come back to this. Okay, so just title, poster, description, something super simple on the formatting. And I've got my movies container here. So I'm going to um, just create a new page with the existing advanced theme, and then I'm going to change that advanced theme uh, and uh, show you the difference. So I'm going to create a new page, page asset, and then I'm going to type in intranet movies page and then if I just click this then I've got my intranet movies template All right I save and publish this and then we can see that I've got this basic guy here in preview mode and um, here uh, if I go to add content right now this guy is allowing what content types to be added, just generic content right here, right? That's it. We're going to change this in the advanced template to allow more than just generic content. As a matter of fact, we'll allow generic content and movie content, right? Right here, okay? We will not change any of the others, okay? So now we'll go back. Do that. That's my movies container, my template, internet movies template. Right, right. Okay. So I'm going to first go to my movies container and I'm going to add generic content as well. And I'm just going to add body. So if if the if the user chooses to put generic content, it'll allow just the body to be placed there. And then if it's movie content, it'll format those fields because the generic content is rich text. It only has basically one field. You know. Um, so that movies container now will be used on our template. We go to the Internet Movies template, which is the advanced template, and then I want to look at it's MD3. This is our large column container here. So I believe div class twelve. So this is our container that's consuming the entire width right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just not use that, uh, that container anymore. I'm going to add container right here and choose the new, I'm just typing MOV for the movies container. 
click that, it will automatically do the dot parse for me and include the parse of the identifier of the container. I really don't have to do anything except put it inside of those divs, decide how I want it laid out on the grid, and um, save and publish. All right. Now I go back to my Internet Movies page, and now here, whenever I go to add content to see if I chose wisely, then, um, yeah, here's my generic content, my movies. Now I can see King Kong, you know, uh, or sorry, uh, Godzilla. And um, so I can click movies and then just select that one. And now I should be able to see the title of the movie and the description the second I select it. Right? Real easy peasy. So um, I really don't need to show this, but um, here is uh, the new way to resize using uh, binary images. So um, there is a shorty URL that what we want here, the right way to refer to a binary field on a piece of content would be to um, iterate over the, the item itself. So we would do something like from the container, it's content dot, uh, and then the name of the field, which is poster, and um, then uh, we could do our shorty URL, and that would be something like this. And we can also put a, you know, a width after it. So I'm going to try and manipulate that uh, resize to use the proper methodology for resizing that image. The container, it does, does work. It's just not uh, optimized. So I would go back to my container and my movies container and my generic content here. Oh, sorry, my movies content. And what we're going to do is manipulate this path. So let's go ahead. And basically what we want is, you know, this type of pattern in here. And uh, so we, but we can't use news item. This is going to be... And I believe that that is poster. Let me just make sure that I remember how to get this first. Oh, I know I put this in my Evernote. <laughs> so let me consult my Evernote. you all know how to do this. simple and save and publish and then I will open up in a new tab let me go here to our page our internet new movies page and Then here, let me go to my container code. Uh, right. 
give it one more shot. And if not, then we'll move on and I'll get it during the break. No, okay. I will figure that out. I forget exactly how to reference the piece of content that you're currently on. We're going to get the identifier and we're going to pass it right into then that um, we're going to reference then as long as I can get the identifier of the piece of content that we're currently on, I just forget exactly how to reference it. Then we would mention the binary image name, then the shorter URL, and then do the resize width, right? And uh, so we'll do that um, after uh, today's you know, break in the middle of session. I'll look at my notes a little better and we'll get that in. So I can just show you best practices whenever you uh, click on add variable. It always doesn't show you the latest updated method. It does show you a working method, but doesn't show you the latest updated method sometimes for doing things like uh, resizing an image or something like that. So just, you know, it's not perfect. It's just a, it suggests a, a way, not necessarily the most optimized way. Okay, so that's basically how you handle styling of any of your containers that you parse in a uh, you know, in your container, you just say how each field should be wrapped. You don't have to include every field from the content type whenever someone's adding static content to the page. Now, if we wanted to on our page add a widget to dynamically, you know, uh, display movies or something like that on the page, then we can add a variety of different widgets. We can add a simple widget to just drop velocity on the page and parse all the movies, uh, you know, the latest, you know, 10 that were added to the system or something like that. We could create a new movies widget content type that would allow you to do things like um, select um, certain things for uh, creating a pull of content. Let's see, widget, maybe uh, news listing. There we go. So you could create for your content contributors in a no code way so they could actually create their own, you know, you know list of 20 news items by descending. by publish date. And then they could just click on, I want a title, I want a summary, I want the publish date to display, I want the, the categories only to be private banking on the news, and this will create, and I you know want 20 items per page, I want it paginated, and this way you can create for your content contributors a way that they can automatically, you know, uh, latest private, banking news, or maybe I'll just put private banking news, number of results, 40, and maybe I decrease the amount so I can see some pagination, see if that's still working. Results, sort results by, I would choose the published date and the order would be descending if I'm not lying in my title, right? And then I would say 10 items per page, so I'd 10 items, you know, per page, save and publish. And then, you know, I guess there's no private banking news. So I don't want to edit my widget. I want to, not the code. Let's see. I will check all of them to be safe. <laughs> And now I should be able to get something. Save and publish button, a no code way to go ahead and do all this. Now I'm getting all of that news. I would have to change the title since it's not private banking, but you know, I'd have to check and see how some of these are categorized, pension, retirement, and retiree. You know, um, that's the tag. And then they're categorized by retirement. You know, so maybe I could, you know, redo my widget here and say retirement. Uh, 
retiree banking news and and then get rid of those now it's obviously going to be much more limited but i think you get the idea by now his only one <laughs> great um so um so this is uh, how you could dynamically place content on a page and do that even with no code um, or, or statically with no code. So it um, depends upon um, how you want to construct it for content publishing, but it can be as easy as you want to make it for your content publishers. And they just simply don't have to worry about styling. And the second they click then on something, it automatically goes exactly where it needs to go because the widget does all the work or the container does all the work. If your content publishers are worrying about styling, in my personal opinion, you've done something completely wrong as a webmaster. If the only fields that you're giving to your content publishers is a WYSIWYG, you've done something completely wrong and are opposing the idea of using a content management system uh, in the majority of the cases. I would say you can be much more creative than that as a webmaster. You can make it so that they're simply, whenever they go to edit a piece of content, they fill out fields, they fill out geolocation on a map, they don't have to paste in latitude and longitude. No, they do a one click on a map and they're done, right? Uh, you know, publish date, setting time publishing, you know, it should all just be automatic. Yes, certainly. Do you need to use WYSIWYG fields? Yes. And sometimes our content publishers are going to have to put pictures within that text, embedded within that text in separate places. Uh, yes. But you should also give them the option to say, hey, you know, if you want an article, just type your text. Yes, do some text formatting, but uh, the images are going to appear in a standard place if you place it here. If you place it inside of your WYSIWYG, then it'll appear wherever you put it inside of your WYSIWYG, you know, and just make it as easy as possible for them, even whenever, uh, you know, you need to include WYSIWYG fields, right? So, um, and that's how we get this particular look and feel. We get social networking links. We get all of this without the user having to worry about CSS or styling or you know manipulating and, and dropping necessarily images or captions within their WYSIWYG. All right. And we get related news to that article and everything like that just automatically and dynamically. Okay. So the containers control the formatting of the content and however many pieces of static content you want to be able to add in a certain area of a page, each container has its own permissions, right? So if I, I want to go into movies container and I want to add only certain permissions for certain roles, maybe I only want this publisher legal role to be able to use it. Um, you only need to give the user or user role view on a container to be able to use that container and add content. And of course, in addition to having access to be able to do something with the container, the user is going to have to have permissions in addition to the uh, movie's content type. And, um, you know, so here's our movie's content type or our generic content type. They're going to have to exist here too and have access, you know, to be able to add that type of content in the first place as well. Right. So we'll go over permissions at the beginning of um, our, our training tomorrow, but uh, definitely that is uh, part of it as well. OK. So let's go ahead and move on in the agenda to the form content type. I'm going to see if there are any questions. I don't see any questions typed in so far to the control panel. Now, you can create uh, forms using the, uh, the form creator. And the form creator is just basically, you know, whenever you go to add a new content type, what type of content do you want to create? Do you want to create a new form content type? I can filter right now through and um, let's see, do I have a form content type? I think it's called uh, contact us. There we go. Here is the form content type. So um, a general contact form. Here is the description. So I can click into it, and it's just a regular content type that is of base type form. So 
general contact form. And it's got a form title, a form email, a form return page, and then I can drag and drop any uh, amount of fields that I want here uh, for this uh, form content type. So you can see there's you know email, phone, address, city, state, zip, you know, country, and these are just regular fields, you know, nothing special about them. They might have a little bit of validation for the, the type of content they are using regex there. Um, and we have inside of our demo a demos area. Where is demos? And that rest content. No, that's not it. Where's our contact us? There we go. Contact us section index. Now, this is that form we were just looking at created as a form content type, okay, uh, with no code whatsoever. I would never personally use one of these um, forms uh, unless I was a person who did not know any HTML or, or JavaScript. Um, the reason being is you cannot edit them after you create them. You'd have to edit the form content type and change the fields there. You can do some limited styling by putting some uh, widgets up above, or you could put, um, you know, include styling that would override the, the Dojo field styling here that we automatically use because we automatically ship with Dojo libraries to, you know, s stylize certain, you know, fields. But, uh, and this, you know, it does, does work. But um, I can't get in and edit. I can't put JavaScript in the middle to open and close uh, fields or something like that. So if you are a content publisher or a webmaster who is not comfortable with JavaScript or HTML, uh, then you would go to content types and add a new form content type. You know, new form and create it automatically gives you email emails who's going to receive the notification that the, the you know this has been submitted the return page you just put in you know uh, some page that's got the uh the thank you uh, messaging the form host automatically will sense you know once there's a submission where you know it uh, is come from because you can use forms the same this the same form we could use on multiple hosts and uh, it would automatically record which host the form got submitted from and then save to that host and then you know the people who have permissions to that host would see the form contact i'm going to add uh you know a movie review form uh movie title uh movie And then uh, maybe a text area movie review. And I don't know, you could add categories, you can add whatever you want. Um, and uh, let's just save something simple here. I could put in my form email and go to, you know, dean at .cms.com. I just filled out nonsense. The form title is basically, um, you know, what they're going to get in the email, um, the movie review form. And then I could go to any page now after I've created this new form. So let me go to the about us. I'll go to that internet movies page we were on. And I'll just remove that uh, content. I'll remove this widget. And I'm going to put a form, and then I can see I've got the contact us or the new form. You know, I can go ahead and place that there. And now I've got that movie title and my movie review. I'm ready to say, you know, save and submit, right? Um, and, but I, like I said, I can't edit it. I would never use a form like this myself personally. We do have in our demo. An example of a REST API form, and in our documentation, we have, uh, if you look up REST, a form that you can have total control over, which is preferable. And we are building a form creator that will build REST API forms that you can edit. Uh, we are not there yet, but that is coming up in our uh, 
in our 2019 um, roadmap and that should be I am hoping released before the end of 2019 if not it should be in the first quarter of 2020 and if we look up content and like saving a, you know content API saving via a post Right, so here is an example of a REST API form. You can copy this and basically paste it in, and you know it, it'll instantly turn into form, and it'll submit to the the generic content container. So it just works right out of the box. So um, it's not hard uh, as long as you can understand the code and enough to manipulate the uh, JavaScript variables and the HTML here down below. But we have an example of that right on our demos section. Here is a RESTful content save form. And you notice the big difference is on this form, if I go to edit mode, that um, I can step into this form and I can edit the code myself. If we click here, it's just, this is a widget that is pulling the request prospectus VTL. And if I look here, then I can step right into that request prospectus VTL and I can edit the entire form and do whatever I want with all the fields, right? So we have complete working examples of, you know, both types of form, either a no code form or a full code control form, uh, whichever type of form you'd like to use. I certainly recommend uh, this one if you've got, you know, a webmaster who can handle that type of work, which most teams on the enterprise level certainly do. Okay, so um, moving, let's go ahead and take a quick 10-minute uh, break. So it's right now, um, right at the hour. So we'll, let's go ahead and come back at 10 after the hour, and um, we will start off then with push publishing and then move right into workflow scheme. So be right back after a 10-minute break.
Okay, so let's go ahead and pick back up um, with uh, push publishing. And so if we were going to set up a new push publishing connection between maybe this environment and another environment, let's go ahead and see if we can set one up to um, an Amazon instance I have running. So let me go, I guess. Let's go ahead and set this up in a different container. Let me open up in a new incognito window another server. I just set this one up for the purposes of a demo, so let's go ahead and do this one. Uh, and it's also, I happen to know it's running 5.1.1. Or is it just admin? Yeah, okay. All right, so um, this left-hand side is my local host, and it's going to be my sending or server, and then this is going to imitate like a staging server or a production server. So I'm going to go to system and configuration, and I'm going to go to publishing environments here, and then here I'm going to do the same thing, system and configuration, push publishing environments, right? So I have to set up the handshake on both sides, it has to have the same password on both sides so that uh, I can uh, push things from one server to another. So I'm going to here on my sender, which is my local host, I'm going to go ahead and add an environment and that, you know, be, you know, maybe it'd be staging or production or something like that. I'll just call it Amazon prod or something like that. And push to one endpoint would be stat standard if you were pushing to a node in a cluster because clusters automatically broadcast. So if you push to all endpoints and you were actually pushing to endpoints that are part of a cluster, that would be useless broadcasting. So you set up which users or user roles have permissions to be able to use this environment and send to this environment. So I'm just adding a user just to add a user. Um, and now I would have to add the actual endpoint. So here I'm going to take this HTTPS, um, you know, instance here. I'm going to add my endpoint, select the type. It's going to be a dynamic.cms HTTPS port 443. And uh, the endpoint name is going to be, um, you know, I guess I'll just go ahead and use this demo name, and uh, I'm going to send it there on 443, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 will be my password, although you could put a path to a text file that would have some sort of, you know, standard, uh, you know, some sort of encrypted password inside of it or something like that. So you could put forward slash, some, you know, some path forward slash, you know, my file dot txt, right? It'd have to be a text file, though, to be easily readable here by the, you know, handshake checker. So I've set this one up on this side. Now I need to set up the receiving server to be able to receive from me. So I'm going to have to look at what is my IP. And it's possible I could have something set up in Amazon that would be preventing me. I'm not sure how I set up this server, but I'm going to put, uh, you know, Dean's computer and hopefully this permissions on this Amazon instance will allow me to do this. And I'm going to set, put the same exact handshake shake token, which hopefully on a real instance would be something a little bit better than that. And uh, what I can do is I can test integrity now and find out if I've got duplicates of anything here that is also a duplicate here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to refresh 
check integrity here and see if this Amazon instance is going to allow me to link. But even if it doesn't, even if there's something set up on the security in the server which is going to disallow me, I should now be able to already see uh, the ability to push publish and I'll talk about the options there. But let's just see if it's going to cooperate and allow me to do this without too much without too much fiddling around with it. Okay, no integrity conflicts found. So let's see if there is a movies content type on this. Okay, there is not. So what I can do on this receiving server is I could go here, just do something simple. Uh, I have 511, you know, what you really want to make sure of is you have 511 here and 511 here. I am pretty sure that this one is also 511, so I should be able to go to the movies content type and just do something like push a piece of content. Now, you may say, well, hey, this new movies piece of content, Dean, and you would be right, has a dependency, which is the movies content type. Right, And also there's categories being used on this Godzilla guy here um, that also, uh, you know, are dependent. So, and you are completely correct. Let me show you how the push publishing system handles this and handles the dependency push. And let me also talk to you about push publishing options. So my available workflow actions are, you know, choose a regular workflow action or choose a push publish. Now that I've got push publishing con is configured and it already knows that this is the only environment that I actually have permissions to push to. It's the only one set up. So it automatically chooses it. Otherwise it would allow you to choose from multiple environments that you had permissions to. Now, what are the options here whenever you're actually push publishing? You can push right now right or you can push right push and set a future date and time um, or you can say oh, oh I just pushed this content now I need to remove it from that receiving server and it's it's just a take back methodology it doesn't unpublish or anything like that it is a push to remove what you whatever identifiers you have in the current bundle right now I'm just pushing one individual piece of content but you could actually take a bundle of a bunch of folders pages content and you could unpublish the entire thing whatever IDs for the objects are it will remove them from the receiving server or I could push and remove, I could push today at a certain date and time, and then I could remove on a future date and time and choose you know, which environment and click push. And then it would push now and, or at that publish date, and then it would expire. And uh, the content and objects that I'm pushing right now would automatically be set to disappear as if they had never been pushed at all uh, at that time. Like I said, they don't unpublish on the receiving server they are removed completely okay so but a typical content contributor actually wouldn't even see this box at all okay let me show you um, so a, a typical content publisher um, what you would want to do for them is maybe give them a one-click push publishing option and I'll show you that uh, whenever we cover workflow which is our next item so I'm going to just click push right now, though. And you might say, OK, well, then how do I know that this piece of content and all its dependencies should have reached the destination server? So under site, if you're going to allow users to push publish, then you should give them the publishing queue. The publishing queue shows what's queuing up, what's waiting to be push published. And so we can see that this movie is pending. Right now, if I look under status history, there is the bundles already been sent to the receiving server. And um, then I'm just waiting and I can keep refreshing and it already has now achieved success, right? And if I want to see a report on it, I can click on it and whether it's succeeded or whether it's failed, it gives me a kind of a report and, you know, uh, maybe some reasoning why. Although I could look at my .cms logs and I could also check it out there. Now, if I come over here to um, content types and I just refresh this. And now I've got the movie's content type now the dependency content type was pushed as well as I come over here to my content 
and I go to movies, the piece of content itself. If I click inside of the piece of content, then I see that the dependency categories were also pushed, right? Which is pretty cool. And the related cast members were pushed. So I have my complete object, my binary file, everything, my tags were pushed all over to the receiving server. So if I look at my content types, I not, not only have movies now, but I also have casts because there was a relationships field there. Now there's a limitation on this type of push for the categories. And let me show you what that is. It did not push every genre category. It only pushed, if we look here, what it does in this case, is it says, okay, there's an action category, an adventure category, and a fantasy category, and the parent category is genre. So those are the only three things that it should have pushed. Okay. So um, it pushed genre and it pushed uh, action. Oh, actually, it pushed all of them. That's actually better than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually good. Uh, I did not put the movie cat category type. Um, normally, um, it should actually only just push uh, the whatever it needs to make this piece of content that's being pushed whole. Um, but I'm actually either either I already had a category here that I had imported, or it actually is even working better now than the pre <laughs> than previously. Um, it will always at least push the dependencies it needs to make that piece of content complete. But I can see that actually it worked even better and it got every single um, genre category, top level genre. Yeah, and it also um, ended up pushing for me even if I go down here to like sci-fi my tertiary level categories as well. So fantastic. Um, and that is how you set up push publishing. Uh, and then we'll sh cover some more options in the, uh, while we're covering the workflow. Now, if I look under history now, I can see every change that I've made to Godzilla King of Monsters here. And then I can also see a push publishing history. So it's smart enough to know I already pushed this piece of content. So right now, if I actually push this piece of content again, and I click push publish, it'll do nothing whatsoever. It will not push this piece of content. Now, why would that be the case? Well, let's look at it. The system, what if the user selects, you know, if there's a ton of content and the user selects everything? and says, I want to push publish. Well, .cms wouldn't be too smart if it had already pushed all of this content just a few minutes ago, and then .cms started consuming resources again to push content that has neither changed nor been added new since the last push publish. That would be not very intelligent by the system because a lot of people are going to be adding things all day. Then they want to just update their, their remote server and they just select everything and they just start pushing things at random. And we don't want to be consuming resources or network space on the uh, bandwidth uh, for pushing everything, even though there's no reason for it to be pushed at all because it hasn't even changed. Right. So what we do uh, normally is we go ahead and say whenever somebody selects a huge list like this, maybe hundreds of thousands of pieces of content, what do we want to push publish? Only the ones that have changed since the last push or that have been added new. Right. Now, when would you then need to use this force the push of everything option? Well, what if I pushed all of this content over to the other server. So my local host thinks all of this content has been pushed, none of it has been changed, and then I wanna push again. 
what my local host doesn't know is maybe somebody on the production server. This is why we say don't author from two different points. Author from one point and then push to everywhere else. Um, if you do allow authoring on both the sender and authoring on both the receiver, what somebody could come in and do is they could um, then unpublish and then maybe archive. And then even come over here to archived and delete that piece of content. All right, so now Godzilla is gone. All right, and there's, you know, so if right now I just went to movies and I clicked here and I clicked push publish, nothing would happen whatsoever because on the local host, Godzilla has not changed, but on the receiving host, somebody was really mean and deleted the piece of content. But this local host doesn't know that and thinks that, uh, hey, I already pushed Godzilla just a few minutes ago and nothing has changed on it whatsoever, so why push it again, right? So what you can do is if you do know something like that is happening or you don't see it being pushed on the other side, even though it's you know uh, saying something was successful, you can push publish and you can use the force push option. The force push will say, I don't care if I've already push published it in the history before, push it again, and then you can track that once again using the publishing queue. You can look at the status history. It's already sent the bundle, you know, and in a few seconds, it'll say that uh, once again, it had success. I'm going to delete that previous success, and it's winding up the content. I'm actually impatient, so I'm just going to come up here and refresh. And it hasn't made it yet. It's still winding up, but you know, it's on its way. So that's the way you would handle content that you've already pushed before, right? And already got sent over before. While that's being sent over, let me go ahead and now uh, move on to how do you hook up that push publishing inside of a workflow. We're moving on to custom workflow schemes, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and put a push publish action inside of our system workflow. And it wouldn't make sense to put it in our published action. So here is our workflow. All right, and I'm going to go into this published action. I'm going to add a push publishing action, and then we're going to kind of backtrack and show you how the workflows are controlled. So I'm going to add a new step, and I'm going to call it um, push to prod. Okay. I guess it'll stay in the current step, which is published who can use it, admin user, sure. When should the button actually appear to this user? While they're editing the content, certainly whenever they right click on it in the listing, whether it's locked or whether it's unlocked, sure. Uh, it should be published content. Um, not whenever it is new or unpublished. And I don't think there's any reason for any assignment. And then let's go ahead and we're going to save the content. We're going to, I guess we could publish the content. And then we could put here, I guess if they, and if it's unpublished, then show it, sure. And I'm gonna, I don't wanna notify an assignee. I'm going to then push now, okay? And I'm gonna click save here. Now in my other, in my system and configuration, I need to know the name of my environment. I'm gonna copy this, Amazon production. And I'm gonna click on my push now and I have to perfectly paste that name, right? Do you always want to use the force push? No, save, all right? 
Now, whenever I'm editing a piece of content that is um, using the system workflow, uh, I believe this one is using the workflow, I should be able to right click on it and push to production immediately, right? So let's add a new um, movie to the system. I will choose um, It's somewhere in here. There we go, demo. Posters and um, we'll go ahead and do uh, Ratatouille. And we'll say it's animation and comedy. Maybe we'd put uh, Pixar in here and <laughs> and um, Okay, and uh, I'm not going to put any cast members. I'm just going to save and publish that piece of content. Once I've published it, then in that published action, there is a push to prod, right? So I'm going to do a one-click push to prod. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Okay, let me configure that again because I don't. I want the instant push now option in my workflow workflows system workflow and in push to prod on oh, push now that's configured uh, hmm. Wondering if these two got um, somehow confused with each other. And uh, let me see, that's not going to actually do it. Um, oh, okay, I think I understand. Okay, let's do this. make sure we're not getting any kind of default action. That should be exactly how we configured it. It's not this. It's push now. And it's this, the environment name. And save. Let me unlock my content, edit my content, lock it for editing, and push to production. It should, that should just be a one click push publish, and it should not be popping up this. That actually should not be happening. I'm just curious now. So I will put that actually in as a bug. I'm just curious as to, you know, that is what should be happening if we put our push publish action. That's what should happen. I'm wondering if somebody in our latest version got that confused and 
reference them both. And I push to prod and see that's what should happen whenever you do push to prod. That's Amazon production. Is it not finding my configuration name? Push publishing environments. Amazon production. That's certainly the right name. Yeah, looks like that was just configured um, improperly in our latest release version. So I'll put in a little bug to go ahead and make sure that, that um, actually is fixed on our 5.2 release. But um, uh, that is the way that it should work. Whenever you go to push publish something, you should be able to right click. You know, I should be able to select push to production and it just goes. It should not be presenting this dialog box. Small difference, you know, but, um, you know, you shouldn't have to, you know, uh, do that. Uh, so I am um, going to report that and see what the bug is there. All right. So um, that is about everything for the regular dynamic push. However, if we have a different type of push publishing, I want to cover what else you can do, is we could add a static environment. And I could set up at an endpoint and I could set up a static AWS 3 or a static uh, server itself, which requires a little bit of configuration. And whenever you choose static AWS S3, um, it allows you to define a access key, a token, everything from your AWS S3 account uh, bucket where you can provide variables like, you know, the host name, the language variable, because you might be pushing French content from this host. You might be pushing English content from a host. So it'll actually make a different bucket for all of your different languages, your different host names, based upon the parameters you actually push. And then you could reference that static bucket independently using domains that are attached to AWS 3. Right. So, and this, is, of course, is all in all of our push publishing documentation on how to do that. Right. So, whether you're pushing to a dynamic .cms server or you're static pushing to AWS3 or you're static pushing to another just Linux server, uh, you can handle all that there in the push publishing integration. Okay. So then, um, the custom workflows. What else can you do on a custom workflow? So just basically looking in our workflows right here, uh, let's look at this document management workflow. And let's expand this since we are done with uh, push publishing for now. Okay, so I've got uh, several different steps. If I wanted to add a new workflow step like, you know, I don't know, there's nothing really after archived, but uh, you know, new step. You know, I can then start adding sub actions, you know, to that um, step or actions to that step and then sub actions as well. Or I can delete that new panel, right? Uh, so here, if I want to look at what users have access to this, I could pick a specific user like, uh, you know, Joe Contributor um, and then look by the actual workflow. And I can see he can do these things here. Um, if I want to look at Jane, a reviewer, I could look at her. She can do a few more things in the review step. And then if I want to, you know, I've been looking by user so far. Let me, let me look by user role. Anything that doesn't have a user at the end of it is a role. So then I'd be able to look at what publisher legal users can do. And they can click on all of these buttons all the way to getting things to, you know, this type of content, document content, all the way to published and archived. All right. So they're the final approvers. Now, um, that way I can get a complete, complete horizontal view of who can do what on all of the different workflows, right? 
So now, oh, I don't want to add another step. Uh, if I wanted to copy a specific, let's just say I wanted to add a new step here for you know my editing step, I wanted to you know push to production. And I want the publisher legal users to be able to create a new uh, piece of content and push publish it instantly. I would then say, you know, what happens? My content gets saved. My content gets, you know, pushed now. I'd configure that environment. Um, I would maybe publish it as well. Oh, I don't want to push publish. I want to publish the content. And whatever you put in an order, that's the way it happens. So save, publish the content, then push now. Save that order. And then only those users will actually see the button. Right? And let's just say, in addition to being, whenever this final publisher legal role does it from the editing step, they should be able to do it from the review step, the publisher legal, they're the final approvers. So I can just grab this and I can move, oh, I don't want that, I want push to production to be here. And then I want to grab it and move it over several times, maybe all those three. And then if you highlight it, you can understand that you're editing this same action has the same options throughout all of the different workflow steps. I could click on any one of them and edit all four of them and alter that, right? So I could also do things like uh, before the user sends for review, I want to link check the content. So I can click in here and I want to run the link checker. I can see I already did this actually in a previous uh, demo here and using this local host. So I want to link check the content. I can even put in a comma separated list of fields that those are the only ones I want to check or I can just check, check all of them by default. Uh, I'm going to get out that send a user email here. Um, Unlock the content, notify the assignee, and link check the content. Uh, anyone who can edit content. So that'll run a link checker. So let's step in right now. And there's tons of different sub actions. Four eyes approval. You click on four eyes approval, and there's options for setting a comma separated list of user IDs, emails, roles, number of approvers that are required by the committee, the email subject, the email message, you know. Um, and that can be HTML rich. You can even have JavaScript velocity in it if you want. Um, and there's tons of different actions. Automatically translate the content with one click into 40 different languages. It depends upon how many languages you have installed in your system. And then you just put the service API for Google Translator for whatever translation service you're using. Right? So there's tons of different sub actions, and it's really easy for webmasters to add their own. Right? Okay, so we're just going to link check the content and then move it to the reviewer the second that they click on this. So now I'm going to step in using my login as feature. I'm going to try and see if I can move my content from one to the other using this workflow scheme. Oh, and how do you apply the workflow scheme once you've created it to any content type? We go to the content type. We look in our document content type. And this was placed on our document content type. We can see here that it's using document management, but it could also be using the, um, the system workflow as well. So it just depends upon what I want to uh, use here. Here I could type in system and then click on you know, system workflow and update it right? uh, and add that as well. So if I now look at workflow, I see both of them are, are checked, even though I'm, I'm zoom, super zoomed in on my screen. So that's why it's kind of making it hard to see both of them are checked. Okay. Or I can uncheck that box and update. And now it's only using the document workflow. So then if I log in as right now, that Joe contributor who has access pretty much only to that document content type, Now I can step to the content tab 
And if Joe tries to add a new piece of content, choose some file asset, add a Guardians of the Galaxy poster. And whatever, he's just going to save his draft. You can see that's the only button he has whenever he's adding new content he can't publish. And it says he doesn't have permissions to even save to the host. He has to save to his little resources directory, and that way this content will be permissioned only to people who have permissions to the resources directory. Right? It'll permission itself after the save. So now it's saved to the resources folder. Now what options does he have if he doesn't uh, lock this content? He has send for review without the content being locked. If I lock the content, he has save his draft. Right? He make changes. Save that piece of content and then go back into the content and uh, release the lock and then he can send it for review. So He's going to send it for review. I don't have any bad links in here, but if I had bad links in the, uh, you know, if I had a WYSIWYG field, there were bad links, I could, it would automatically link check my content as well. Um, you know, Jane, please review. I can click save. And um, now if it goes in a review step, you can see that it's in step review and it's assignee as reviewer and he doesn't have any, you know, he can only save his draft and that's it, but he can't take it away from, you know, the reviewer role. I'm going to have him unlock that content, release lock. Okay, so I'm going to log out as him and I'm going to log in as Jane Reviewer. And she's going to go to her workflow tasks, and she sees if she logs in, she goes to her workflow tasks. She hears this Guardian's image. You can see the Joe contributor sent it to her seconds ago. Gives her a preview of the content, even the metadata. And it's either user can either go ahead and return it for edits, or you know, edit the content from the workflow. This is the workflow task. This is not the piece of content, right? Or I can step right into the piece of content, and now we see what the reviewer role has access to. She can send it to legal automatically, or lock it for editing and make changes. Right? So we can send it to legal. Please publish. Click on save, and then that content in, you know, she doesn't have the workflow task anymore. That content, if she opens it up, it's in legal approval, assignee is publisher legal. Right? So we log out as Jane. We want to log in as somebody who has that publisher legal role, and I know that there is a um, user, Chris Publisher, that has that uh, publisher legal role. So if you look at his workflow task, there's that guardians, you know, it went from Joe to Jane. Now it's to Chris publisher. And we could step right into the content itself if we wanted to. And we can see we he's got the push to production. He's got the publish of the piece of content. I just click publish and it's automatically now in the publish step. And I can see that my content here, let me go to content instead of workflow for that document content has been published, right? So we stepped in as three different users, saw that they all have three different buttons whenever they're all editing the same exact content. Right? And different sort of options there. Okay. And that is workflow. It is very, very easy for um, webmasters to add new workflow actions. As a matter of fact, webmasters can, if they want to have a new workflow sub action, they can just go, um, let me log out as that user. Under DevTools and plugins, you can upload a new plugin. We have OSGI plugins that are ready to go for all our enterprise users so they can add sub actions to the workflow. All you'd have to do is upload the uh, plugin right here 
And the second that you deployed it, you don't even have to restart your .cms. You can just go back to your workflow and you will see the new workflow sub action there. All right, very, very easy to extend. That and rules engine, rules, conditions, and actions are most extended by our enterprise clients. Okay, now we already covered how you could set up the broken link checker in the workflow, but let's actually add to that document content. Let's, let's actually see it happen. Let's add a WYSIWYG field here. Call it uh, extended description. And let's go to Joe Contributor and try to see if we can see that link checker. This is probably the preferable way to do link checking right there in the workflow. Nobody even has to think about it. So we go back to Guardians. Uh, well, let's go back to a brand new piece of content because he's got the send to workflow from the editing and we'll put Braveheart in here. Okay, so if I wanted the real history of William Wallace here to be some link, and I did a bad thing. Okay, that obviously is not going to work. Okay, and now I've got that link there. Now I can save his draft all I want as long as I save his draft to the right folder. And I can save his draft. Now uh, that worked just fine, but the send for review action actually has the link checker on it. So I make some sort of commenting here and I click save and send for review. Um, and this guy did not do it, but he also didn't give me the uh, let me check my sub actions here. Log out, types and tags, workflows, send to legal. No, not that. Send for review. I want the link checker to happen first. Save. And now let's get back into this. Log in as Joe. And go back to my content. And I open it up. And it's still in the editing step. So, oh, well, he's not in the release lock. Send for review, make a comment, save, and then there we go. It needed to happen first before we try to do anything else to it. And it shows us we've got some bad links and it shows us what we need to do to fix it. So I can highlight this here. I will add a fake link. And let me remove that link first. Right, which will resolve. And click OK. And now I'm going to need to save it first, right? Save my change, release my lock, send for review, make some comment, and now it should go into the review step. And it is in the review step now and with Jane Reviewer, right? And he can't really do much more with the content. Okay, makes sense. Now we can also do something like here, if we log out as Joe first, we can run our link checker here. 
under content, we can run our link checker. So I could just, and we have obviously under the generic content type, we've got several broken links that we've automatically created in the starter so that you can actually see it uh, and act active. But if I wanted to go to my document content type and I wanted to run a check right now and check all of my document content types for broken links, I could do that. And what's typically set up by a webmaster is a cron job that runs every single night and checks all of the content and emails everyone who is the author of bad content. So if we wanted to, we could set up a brand new, if I look under my user roles, I am logged in as a CMS administrator. So if I edit this role and add a new tool, which basically is one of these left-hand navigation items, I can go to tools and I'll set up a new uh, custom tool group and I will call it, uh, or I could add it under system. Maybe I'll just do that. I'll add it under system. And so then I'm going to choose another tool, which would be link check job scheduler. I will add that tool. Now I can see job scheduler down at the bottom underneath sites. I can click save. And now just let me make sure I refresh. And here's job scheduler underneath uh, system. Right? If I click on job scheduler, I can uh, see system jobs. I can set up uh, user jobs. I want to set up a new job, right? And I want you know nightly link checker. And I want to execute it starting right now and then never end it. So I'm not going to put a two. And the class to be executed, you know, I could put in here link or actually I have to type and put link checker job. Okay, so I wanted to run that particular cron job. And I can set up a cron expression. Maybe I want it once every day at 1 a.m. So I can put that cron expression to on when to trigger the class to be executed. I click save and now once every night at 1 a.m. it's going to run the link checker job and give emails to everyone who's got bad content because of course somebody could create good content the workflow checks it says it's okay but then those content uh, links go stale over time so you want a combination of things maybe check them whenever they're trying to submit the content in the first place and then also check it on a nightly basis so that uh, if over time those links go stale they'll still be notified in their email and in the workflow whenever they log into that CMS. Okay. And then the last thing we're going to cover is internationalization, and then we'll close out for this particular session. So how do you set up new languages in the system? So if we wanted to look right now at uh, generic content, and you know what, I'll add an automatic translation here of my generic content. Why not? And we will translate the about quest. If right now I try to switch to Spanish, it'll ask me, hey, you're going to translate this, right? Um, so I'm actually going to cancel out of that. I'm going to cancel out of this. I don't want this. I want to be able to automatically translate any of my pieces of generic content. And hopefully you'd set this up right at the beginning before you put in a whole bunch of content in only one language. Right now, if I actually look at my uh, generic content in Spanish, I don't have any. Right? So let's use a combination of what we already learned in workflow and also um, set up new languages. So first we have to actually add a new language. So we go to types and tags and languages and we're gonna add French, right? So we're gonna add a new language. We can add as many as we wish. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and add two languages. Let's go ahead and add language code FR. The description of the language would be French. And, you know, there's different dialects of French based upon which country. So we'd add our, you know, two-letter country code. If you just Google two-letter country and language and country codes, that would be it. And I'm um, going to add country, which would be France. Okay. And then let's go ahead and add um, 
German. Uh, so if you do look up two letter language codes and we look at German, that should be DE, I believe. Yeah, DE. So if I click on it here, uh, language code DE, language German, and sprechen Sie Deutsch, right? That's why the DE. Um, and country code, that would be capital D, and the country which would be Germany. And save, and now I've got German and French and Spanish. Right? So I'm going to one click from English and translate it to German, French, and Spanish all at the same time. Now, how would I do that? I might want to set up a, 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 a workflow that certainly um, I might want to set up a workflow like, you know, a, a translate check sub action or something like that. Um, I would have people who would check this. I wouldn't just publish translated content. So I would add maybe a translation process or something. Let's do that. translation review step and I want that one to be right here and then I'm going to add from the unpublished step I'm going to add a translate action okay and who can use I'm going to just say um, anyone who can edit content I'm going to list it while I'm editing my content Whether it's locked or unlocked, sure. Uh, maybe even from the listing, if it's unpublished. Right. And then what am I going to do whenever this happens? I'm going to save my content. I don't want to publish it, right? Because I want that to be available in the review step, in the translation review. And I want to translate content. Right. I want to save it first, then translate the content into the other languages. Just in case somebody made a change, I don't want to translate it and then save the content. Right? Uh, that wouldn't be good. Um, it seems out of order. And then maybe I would notify a signee. And uh, assign to maybe I'd create a new user role called a translation reviewer, right? Just like Jane reviewer or something like that. I'm just going to assign it to the reviewer role. And I'll click uh, save. However, translate content isn't done it needs a service api key now i do have some service api keys so i'm actually going to put in one for dot cms we have our own little dot cms api key we use for testing purposes so i'm going to put that there into the system save it and I want to save the content, translate the content, notify the assignee, save. Okay. So now I'm going to go to my generic in all languages now, which right now I only have English. And then I'm going to go to that about quest. And this does not have any uh, real English content. So let me get something from .cms.com. A 
let me just copy something here. There we go. Knew there was something somewhere. All right, so uh, let me go back to my content and put that there. There we go. So first thing I have to save the English, right? Lock for editing and save that English, right? Or at least I just want to do that. Um, and I would have to send this content back. Uh, which we'll do that with a work, show you how to send something back in the work because it's already in the on uh, the published step. Um, but an easier way to do that would be if it's already published and this translate step will move it into translate sign to reviewer. Let's not do current step. Let's move it to translation review. Click save. And um, what I want to do now is make that translate action also available if the content is in the published step. And what it'll do is it'll move it, put it at the bottom. Uh, well, there we go. Put it at the bottom. And then it'll move it over to this step. Um, and then maybe I would add a, you know, I would just add a publish action here. So somebody could take the regular publish action right there, and maybe I'd only make that available to, yeah, so maybe I would uh, not do that. Let me remove that, and then I would say approve translation. Right. I would say maybe only the reviewer role could do it. And I'm just going to be expedient here. So, and it automatically will publish the content, move from the current step to published. Uh, we could notify assignees, I guess, and save. And that will publish that content. Okay, and maybe I would have different reviewers for different languages as well, you know, so you could do whatever you wanted there. All right, so I now have that translation action. I think I've set it all up now, and I can save and publish this change, and then lock for editing. Am I not seeing that new action? Content types, workflows, system workflow in the published step, translate. Why am I not seeing you? No. Let me just do all here. Save. Move to the translation review. I want to make that available here too. and probably make that available here, right? So now I go back to my content, my generic content, I open it up. This is, now we see our little translate button, right? So now I'm gonna one-click translate and this should give us all the rest of our language versions. Right now we don't have any. I click translate and that should translate all of my content. And now I should see um, about quest, acerca de quest, apropos de quest, and uh, uh, about requests here in German. If I step inside of any of that, you know, here it is. Dutch is a una plataforma, leader gestión de experiencia de cliente y contenido de código, blah blah blah. 
It may not be perfect, but it certainly gets you 85% of the wear there. If we look here, now this has been translated into French. If we look here, this has been translated into German, right? And is now, if we look at any of these, you know, uh, the step is new. Uh, let's see. Uh, here, this one got put into reviewer. I guess each one of those uh, pieces of content, you know, it does translate all of it, but they could independently be in different steps. So, you know, those would have to be, it would have to be created from the beginning. We stepped into a piece of content that was already in a different step, but you would normally, you know, put it into a review step and then the individual pieces of content could kind of move on from that step in different ways. Each of them could be in a different step. Uh, but right now, uh, since we created it from a step that was more forward into the root process, um, you know, now these guys are not assigned a specific step because they weren't created right at the beginning in that um, basic step. They would still be in the editing step and then have to be moved on through the, the next steps. So that is how to do translation. That is how to configure things in your workflow and have them automatically uh, be handled by that workflow process. And if I now go for the internationalization, I want to review obviously here by any language I can. If I want to just look at Spanish, etc. If I come here to a page and I want to view a page in Spanish, I want to look at About Us. And where is my... Oh, I'm looking at it in Spanish still. Yep. All. Or I could just look at it in English. Okay. Now I go to my index page. My about us. I guess I removed my about us. And content about quest. Here's my about us in English and if I wanted to then you know save and publish this guy and I want to then look at my content in German I'm now looking at my page in German I'm looking at my page in Spanish looking at my page in French right and then I could edit my page and content in those particular languages. And then in the web developer co course, we show you how to make your the rest of your navigation and all of your properties here and properties here, um, you know, that correspond to the language that you're switching to as well. But that'll get into a little bit of code and language variables. So we will get to that in the web developer course. Okay. So that is how to create content, automatically translate content, look at content in different languages in the content tab, look at content in different languages here on the back end on a page as well. Okay. And that kind of wraps us up for internationalization basics and prepares us for session three. We'll be begin uh, tomorrow's session with permissions. And uh, I hope it was helpful. We will be passing on the recordings after uh, we finish the, uh, the tomorrow's session. I uh, hope it was helpful. And uh, we will see you tomorrow, same time. And I promise 